In this lecture, we discuss one of Sexual Citizen's three key concepts, sexual projects. This includes defining it and then sharing an example from the book of how it's useful to understand both sexual assault and sex on campus. We also do something which we don't do in the book, which is to situate the idea a bit in relation to social theory. As in the book, just a heads up, we describe sexual assaults as students recounted them to us. This material can be hard to hear. It was hard for us to hear. And of course, harder even for many of the students to live. If you need to take a break while listening, of course, do so. And if you need someone to call, the RAIN hotline is 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673. In any room, virtual or real, there are always survivors. Please know that you are not alone. So sexual concepts answers the question, what is sex for? Which you might think is the kind of question that only a social scientist would ask, right? Everyone knows what sex is for. Sex is for pleasure or sex is for making babies. But a lot of campus sex is actually not that pleasurable. And none of the students that we talked to were interested in making babies. Um, most of the students that we spoke with couldn't actually answer the question of what sex is for. And so our understanding of sexual projects emerged in the analysis of the interviews with students frequently recounting a sort of bumbling trial and error process in which over the arc of college, they figured out for themselves what they wanted sex to be for, what they wanted it to mean in their lives and how to make that happen. As social scientists, it's not a question of a better or worse sexual project. That's not, that's not our project here. Um, we use sexual projects as a descriptive category. Um, it draws on my earlier work uh, with Mexican uh, women in Mexico and Mexican migrants in the, in, uh, the rural South, um, trying to figure out uh, how sexuality fit in with contraceptive methods. So there's a longer arc to the idea of sexual projects. Happy to recommend some additional reading on that. Um, so in the stories that we heard, we saw five sexual projects um, that's, that emerged from our analysis of student stories. Um, accruing sexual experience, seeking pleasure, connecting with a person emotionally, another person emotionally, um, defining oneself and impressing others. And um, I'll, I'll start with a story that will illustrate um, the variability of sexual projects over time. So um, Diana, and obviously this is a pseudonym, um, was the kind of driven, high-achieving student that um, was that was characteristic of many of the students that we met on the Columbia campus. Um, and she recalled how um, her early sexual experiences in high school fit into that paradigm of achievement. Of course, this is our analysis of her story. This is not how she told it, but she she wanted to get good at sex. That was what she said. And so, for her, getting good at sex. It was a little bit like SAT flashcards. It just meant doing a lot of it. And so rather than go through the hassle of like actually getting in a relationship with anyone, she, um, she hooked up with men she met on uh, an app. Uh, and she was really clear about her boundaries. She said she didn't want to have intercourse with them. And so she would meet these older men in motel rooms near her hometown um, she go off to school while her parents were at home and um, fool around with them, just practice giving blowjobs, getting fingered, learning about her body and their bodies. Um, and to her, uh, that was, it made sense to do that because it was a way of accruing sex, which as she recounted it, she didn't seem particularly um, to connect to an emotional relationship with anyone. It was, it was just, it was about sort of, who she was. She wanted to be a person who was good at sex. Um, when she got to campus, she, she told us a story about freshman year that showed um, one of the ways in which a sexual project that's focused on a combination of accruing experience and seeking status can um, make people vulnerable. And this is not to say that, that the story that I'm going to tell was her fault, but um, it gives you some, it's interesting how she processes what happened to her. So citizens, one of the things that we do in Sexual Citizens is that we widen the lens out from only looking at assault, from looking at things that are um, potentially against the law, to looking critically at ways that students interact with one another sexually in ways that are just unkind. Um, anyway, 
So she and her friends were at a party uh, early in freshman year. Uh, it was in an upperclassman suite. Uh, it was a bunch of guys who were athletes. Um, towards the end of the evening, all of a sudden, everyone disappeared. She was left alone with this guy. She described it as um, some kind of alpha male shit that she felt like she had been chosen for him, maybe by him, maybe by someone else. And uh, her friends, uh, not really clear why her friends left, but his friends all left. Um, he instructed her to take her clothes off. Um, she gave him a blow job, they had intercourse. Then he handed her her clothes and pretty much dismissed her. Um, and as she left, she found that his friends had all been listening at the door. So that was a pretty gross experience. I think that she felt in the moment um, uh, humiliated. And, um, and yet the next day at brunch, uh, she passed the phone around to show her friends this photo of the guy that she'd gotten with. And as she described it, she had a good chit to show in that moment because she had sort of transformed in her mind, um, this experience, which in the moment was unpleasant, not pleasurable, um, to, uh, to a sort of triumphant uh, classic freshman year experience. Um, so the point is not that the sexual project, that her sexual project made this encounter her fault, it's to highlight the ways that the idea of sexual projects can help us see people's interpretive agency. People exercise um, uh, that interpretive agency in making sense of and sort of deploying socially what happened to them. Um, now I'm gonna pass it to Seamus and he's gonna continue on with uh, the next chapter of Diana's story. You know, so one of the critical things in understanding Diana in that first story is the ways in which you know, her sexual project of wanting to accrue experience to, um, you know, basically be something and, and to accrue status was critical for how she interpreted what happened. But as we show in the book, another thing that's important about understanding sexual projects is how it is that assaults happen because of those sexual projects. You know, Diana told us another story. Um, and by the time we spoke to her, she um, almost had the appearance of a kind of monk um, um, where she'd really transformed herself from the story she told us about her sexually adventurous self into something else. And in explaining that trajectory, she told us about how early on in her time at Columbia, um, you know, she had this best friend who was gay and they had this sort of, you know, kind of very fun, flirty relationship. And they would, you know, uh, hang out at parties and get a little drunk and make out with one another. And it was a little bit scandalous, but it was really just a form of play. And at one point in time, her best friend, this man said to her, you know, I think I'm moving down the Kinsey scale for you. And um, it was, as she described it, the hottest line she'd ever heard. And what he meant by this was that, you know, the Kinsey scale is the scale of sexuality where people, where Kinsey imagined that people move from sort of being extremely heterosexual to not at all heterosexual. And he was conveying to her that she was making him feel a little bit more straight. And she got super excited in part because she thought about how she might be able to achieve something. And this ties to her sexual project as really a form of achievement for her. And she wanted to know like, okay, how can she turn this into something even more? Not just like this flirting moment, but something where she can feel like she actually maybe can turn a gay guy straight. And this was super exciting and she didn't act, she didn't know what to do. And so, you know, ever resourceful, Diana was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna call my ex-boyfriend and ask him, how is it that you get people to wanna have sex with you? How is it that you get women to wanna have sex with you? So talking to a straight man was a great solution for Diana to figure out how to make this happen. And, um, her, her ex said, well, you've got to use like the frog in hot water approach. And the description that he gave her was one where, you know, um, at first, you know, you don't want to go all the way or push too hard, but slowly but surely, you know, try and realize the thing that you want. So it might start kind of slowly and then build and build and build until someone does something that maybe they weren't initially thinking they'd be willing to do. But like in a frog in hot water, they, they sort of tolerate the increasing temperature of the sexual encounter. And so 
Diana put this into play. She put this into practice. And, you know, one evening, um, you know, she ends up hanging out again with her gay best friend. And um, she, they, they begin in this kind of flirty fashion. And um, she deploys her frog and hot water approach. So step by step, um, she sort of advances the encounter. And um, uh, he expresses hesitation and uncertainty and discomfort. Um, but eventually they have sex. And at first, Diana is totally thrilled about this. She's super excited. Um, and then she kind of experiences something a little bit different where she notes that he becomes a little bit distant. He starts to say, like, he doesn't respond to his texts as quickly. And she's wondering what happens. And she gets a little frustrated with him for being distant. And, you know, she sort of calls him out on it. And he says to her, well, you know, I didn't really want to have sex. And in that moment, Diana was totally distraught. In fact, he ended up having to comfort her over this moment because, you know, she asked him, oh, my God, did I assault you? Did I assault you? And he said to her, no, you didn't assault me, but I didn't want to have sex. Um, he kind of conveys this, like, discomfort with the ways in which that happened because, you know, he said to her, I'm really, I'm gay. And, and that wasn't really something I, I wanted to pursue and I wasn't comfortable with it. And the reason Diana was kind of like monk-like when we spoke to her is that she described herself in her interview as presently asexual. Um, and she began to radically reevaluate the ways in which her sexual project led her to pursue a kind of sex and sexuality where she felt she was doing harm to other people. So as an idea, sexual projects brings forth to the study of sexual assault an idea of agency. And it asks, what is it that people's goals are for the kinds of sex that they're having? You know, as uh, Jennifer articulated earlier in um, uh, Sexual Citizens, there are a range of goals that we saw. So we saw goals of accruing sexual experience, seeking pleasure, connecting with another person emotionally, defining oneself, and impressing others or acquiring status. But here, um, you know, uh, there are all kinds of things that people are trying to do with sex in college. You know, they may want to have an experience like having sex in the library stacks. And people don't just have one sexual project. So people can both want pleasure, but also want to find a partner who can comfort them. This centers agency in the middle of the idea of sexual projects. Sex isn't just something that happens. It's something that people do and pursue. And understanding how they're doing that is really essential for understanding why sexual assault happens. The other thing that we think about here is a cultural dimension. Why is it that library sex is something that people think is cool and that they want to do in college? Who are valuable sexual partners for people? In some ways, you know, the desirability of a partner isn't just about who you desire, but what's socially desirable and the cultural constitution of that desire. And what people strive for is inexorable from the landscape of shared meaning, a cultural landscape of shared meaning. In this sense, sex is a social behavior, not a health behavior. And that means that the kinds of sex that people want can only be understood by taking into account the cultural frameworks by which they make sense of things. We also think about sexual projects as being deeply tied to inequality. Not all sexual projects are equally available to all people. If we think back to Diana's story and her high school accumulation of sexual experience, this really depends on the underlying social value of access to young women's bodies. And it's hard to think about that happening in the reverse with a high school man finding older women to have sex with in ho hotel rooms to accumulate an experience. This is just one uh, an ex example of the ways in which inequality is deeply infused into the kinds of sexual projects that people have. And a thought experiment that you might do is to ask, what are the ways in which different sexual projects are gendered or different by people with different gender or sexual identities? You might also think when, 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 when imagining that, like what are the differences between being, in the language of the moment, a fuckboy versus being a slut? And how it is that those gendered interpretations of sexual projects influence people? Or we can think, for example, of drunk sex. And drunk sex is something that we found in sexual projects that was much more available to white freshmen than the black ones. In part, that's because black students drink less. 
but it also points to the complex of sex as being part of a sort of racialized risk for breaking the law. So, you know, black students drink less in part because the consequences for them for drinking can be really severe. And so where white students take for granted, you know, their ability to get a fake idea, ID and having that ID not really harming them, for black students, they think about this very differently. In this sense, the agency of sexual projects is deeply structured by forms of inequality and by, by uh, culture, the cultural context that students are in. Ultimately, we think of sexual projects as being part of or subsumed in students' life projects, subsumed in what they want out of college and what they want for themselves. And it's a practice approach to studying sex and sexual assault that helps us better understand why it is that people are doing what they're doing and how it is that broader structures and uh, social relationships influence that everyday practice.